This podcast comes to you from the University of Toronto. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the university operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Yaron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to work on this land, and we strive toward peace and reconciliation among all peoples. Hi, I'm Adam Cohen, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Toronto. Welcome, listeners, to Medieval Art Matters, a podcast where we showcase the vitality of contemporary research on the Middle Ages. In each episode, we invite a scholar to talk about a critical issue that shaped the experiences of people living centuries ago and that still matters today. I'm joined by my co-host, Erica Loic, for a discussion of today's theme, Abstraction and Meaning in Medieval Jewish Manuscripts. Thank you, Adam. I'm Erica Loic, Assistant Professor of Global Medieval Art at Florida State University. Today we're speaking with Julie Harris. She is a specialist in the art of medieval Iberia. Among other topics, she has published on ivory carving, architecture, and illuminated Hebrew manuscripts. She was recently awarded a Center for Spain in America Fellowship at the Clark Institute for her project on decorative carpet pages of Iberian Hebrew Bibles. Welcome, Dr. Harris, and thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you for having me. We're looking at a page from a manuscript that listeners can find on the podcast page of artofthemiddleages.com. Could you briefly introduce the page and the book in which it appears? Well, I think you're talking about Folio One Verso, in a Hebrew Bible from the Bibliotheque Nationale, the shelf number is Hebrew 21. What you're looking at is two things. First of all, fabulous design. But if you have really sharp eyes and you look at the right margin, you'll also see a uh, signature. And the signature is that of Joshua Ibn Gaon, who in this manuscript, he wrote it. It meant he was a scribe. He was a Masoret, which meant he also added the stabilizing apparatus for the Hebrew Bible. And he's also believed to be the artist. And he tells us in this small and sadly abraded colophon on the right side, the right margin of the carpet page, that he made this book. He names himself Joshua Ibn Gaon. He also names his father, son of Reb Avraham. He says that he made the first choir, which is the first gathering of the book. For an honorable man, honorable physician, rabbi or rev, Abraham of Lyria, just an honorific, the rev Abraham of Lyria, son of, and then we have an abrasion, so we don't know who Abraham's father was. We also really have some debate over where Lyria was, whether it was Lyria. We're, we're not really sure because the Hebrew doesn't always tell us exactly the pronunciation of a Spanish or a Portuguese town. So this is the opening verso of a Hebrew Bible. And in having this abstract geometricized design, Hebrew 21 is similar to a number of other Hebrew Bibles of this period, where it's abstract designs that sometimes are geometrical and sometimes they are instead floriate, but they derive from the Islamic world of art history rather than from uh, the world that probably most people familiar with with medieval art would know something about, which is the Christian world. So it's not figural, it's abstract. It may be inspired by contemporary decorative art, the decorative arts, uh, wall stuccos, textiles, we're not really sure. There are many sources which could have provided models. It's a very magnificent opening for the Holy, Holy Bible. Can I just jump in with a quick question for people who maybe don't know a lot about manuscripts? You use the word colophon, and just for people who maybe have never heard that word, what kind of information do we sometimes get in a colophon? Well, if we're really lucky, we'll get the name of the artist, a place of production, and a date. Sometimes if we're super lucky, we get the patron too. Within this book, I should say that this is not the only signature. Joshua Ibn Gaon hides his signature in micrography, which means really tiny letters. And he gives us some more information elsewhere. And because the handwriting is so similar 
we assume that he is responsible for the entire book, of course. So it's not uncommon to find a number of colophons in a book. It isn't always just like today where we have a title page and it says Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens and then wherever it was published and the date. Uh, It's not always that simple, but Hebrew Bibles are very good about telling us some information. Sometimes it's a little tantalizing, but unlike medieval Haggadot from Spain, which do not have, or at least no longer have, surviving signatures, colophons. Hebrew Bibles seem to tell us, are much more likely to give us information about who made them and for whom, and when even. So this is the first page in a Hebrew Bible made by Jewish individual for a Jewish patron. So let me ask the obvious question. Did Jews in the Middle Ages always use abstract, non-figural art in their books? Aren't they worried about violating the second commandment against graven images? Well, you said abstract, non-figural. So in that case, there's absolutely no danger for violating it. What I like to say is that what we know is the second commandment, the prohibition against graven images, is interpreted in many different ways to different levels of intensity throughout the history of Judaism. So it's historically contingent. It's a lot of it is based on where you are and which rabbi is answering the question about it. But abstract ornament, geometrical ornament, floriate ornament is unlikely to provoke anyone to idolatry. (laughs) You're not going to be seeing something, an image of someone to worship. We're not going to be trying to delimit God's perfection, body. We're not going to be doing any of this representation of the divine, thereby, I should say, limiting it or anthropomorphizing God. It's abstract ornament. So it's a pretty flexible medium for decoration. And Jews would like to have decorated books because we've got so many of them. We know that these were highly priced deluxe objects that were much beloved. And their survival also bears witness to that. So decorating something with beautiful ornament allows one to carry on the mitzvah, chidur mitzvah, which is beautifying the ritual of Torah study or Bible study without upsetting even the strictest interpretation of the second commandment. You've said a little bit about everything this image won't do. It won't lead to idolatry. It won't cause any kind of concern. What does it do? Why include a page like this at all? There are a number of interpretations, and I don't think any one of them is better than the other. But so let me give you a list of the things that I've been thinking about. One, and I'm not the only one who's written about it, is that the notion that books may, Hebrew Bibles and Christian Bibles for that matter, may have been originally smaller so that each book itself, like Genesis or Exodus or something, may have been created on its own and wrapped in some sort of precious textile. And so we see across Islam, Judaism, and Christianity in their holy books, these kind of remnants that are very suggestive of textile wrappings. So that might just be evoking this kind of textile wrapping. So it's a memory of a tradition. Another way of looking at it is that it it does stop the person from diving in to the text. And the, the rabbis wanted Jewish people to approach prayer with mindfulness. And there are even traditions that suggest you should meditate, spend some time in silence before one opens the book or opens one's mouth for prayer. So you can think of this as kind of slowing down, and people have written about it, uh, slowing down the approach to the holy text by allowing person's eye to kind of wander and look at the beauty. It tells you that what you're about to see is something important and magnificent and worthy of the effort and expense. Those are two interpretations. I mean, I I have a third, which is that to me, these are not iconographic. And when you think of iconographic, you could say, okay, let's think about the sacrifice of Isaac and how would we paint the sacrifice of Isaac? How would we depict it? You know, and so you would say, well, the iconography is of a table and a donkey and all of these the ram with his horns cut. All of these things are iconographic. So you take an object and you trace it through texts, holy text to explain its presence. These are not iconographic in that way, but I do find them to be, to run fairly parallel to the way the rabbis are writing about Torah itself. So I think of them as being rather metaphorical for the way people in medieval Spain, in medieval Iberia, think about 
holy scripture. Think about the Torah, that it's veiled. You don't expect to get the meaning of it by just grabbing it quickly and running away. You have to ponder it. You have to approach it meaningfully, thoughtfully. And sometimes what you see on the surface isn't the whole story. So that's one metaphor. Those are metaphorical ways of looking at it. And I think that if you look at some of these decorations, you can see those, you can make a case that some of the metaphors we're seeing or ways of describing the Torah, the way the rabbis and scholarly people of medieval Iberia write about Torah, not necessarily about art or books, but Torah itself are mirrored in these abstract frontispieces and carpet pages. I'd like to pick up on that last point, because as much as we are interested in questions of function and meaning, of course, as art historians, we are sensitive to the quality of these things as works of art, as remarkable visual constructs. And so I think that some listeners might be looking at this page and observe that the style is similar to Islamic art. Why might there be such similarities? Well, this is something that people like to point out, that Jewish book culture tends to mimic or tends to resemble the dominant culture in which the manuscripts are produced. And this is a case where it doesn't. This is a case where these manuscripts are produced long after the places where they were made returned to Christian hands. The Islamic polity had taken most of Spain and then slowly in the phenomenon known as the Reconquest, the Christians take parts of it back. Now, these books are produced long after these cities have been now returned to Christian rule, yet they are produced with an Islamicizing style. And so there, I see sort of two explanations for it. One is that this was the style that Jews were accustomed to. This was their visual culture. And and who's to say that they did themselves create artworks long ago that no longer survived that looked exactly like Islamic? I mean, they were part of Islamic culture. They retained their Arabic for years, centuries after, especially physicians. And this book would happen to be made for, made for a physician Long after the dominant culture in the North was Christian, they had some, one might say, cultural sympathy for the art, for the culture of adab, which is high culture, poetry, manners of the Islamic elite. And that combined with the fact that, yes, this is a rather inoffensive in terms of the Second Commandment, I think, lends itself to it. Their homes, their synagogues, we can't say much about the decorative arts, we've got very little, but the aesthetics that we see, one might term mudejar, which is sort of this living tradition of Islamic art as it is reinterpreted regardless of the faith of the person who makes it, is one that is an appealing one. And that, I think, is why it endures. It's connected with luxury, it's connected with sophistication, and there's nothing offensive about a non-figural geometricizing ornament. I'd like to dig into this a little bit deeper and this idea of the, the mudejar and something that I really grapple with a lot is how much do people recognize the style as something that they're, to use a word that you use, mimicking. One form is to mimic, which would imply that you are seeing something that is not necessarily quote unquote yours and adopting it. And another interpretation is that we are all part of a shared visual culture or shared language of ornament. So how much- Well, I would accept that one. The the second? Probably. For instance, we know from documents that the Jews were great manufacturers and um, producers of silk, and that some of the banners even that the Almohads and political powers of Islam in Andalusia used were made by Jews. The Ibn Jana brothers were silk makers and textile makers. So what do we think that their textiles looked like? They were part of this culture. We know that Jews were metal workers. We know that they were involved in the arts. We also know that they had this sophistication, some of them at least, in geometry and in mathematics to make these things. And truthfully, most of the designs could be made by anybody once you figure out the tricks of how to do them. They're not to be a sophisticated mathematician to make some of these designs. So I, you know, I would be inclined to say that Mudejar is a shared visual culture. And if we had any surviving manuscripts, illuminated Hebrew manuscripts from Al-Andalus, we might be able to say that Jews were always making art like this, but we just don't have anything that survives. The only things we have that survive 
are made in the North, but made in the North, you know, in the early 14th century. Well, late 13th, the Damascus Keter is 1260. So it's really only then. But that's long after Toledo goes back to the Christians, which was 1085. So, but why is Mudejar appealing? Like I said, it's a visual culture and it provides a language that allows them, I suppose, to express this ineffable, what one might say the ineffable perfection of Torah, I don't want to go too far with interpreting uh, what ornament can mean in Islamic art. That's controversial too. But it provides a mechanism. And then once one person of the elite has one of these magnificent books, they become status symbols and the next person wants them. So we see this with the Haggadot, which is a completely different language, but they become something that take off. And we have quite a few of them, quite a few surviving from the 14th and 15th century. I think you've done a marvelous job of helping us contextualize this picture in the broader culture of Iberia around 1300. And in fact, one of the things we tried to do in Art and Architecture of the Middle Ages, Exploring a Connected World, is to break Jewish art out of the silo, the academic silo in which it has traditionally been treated. So I'd like to invite you to share some thoughts from your perspective about how you think the study of medieval Jewish art is changing and how you would like to see it develop. Well, I still think we have a lot of work to do just to learn the basics of certain manuscripts that have not been studied and certain archaeological sites that are just being unearthed. So we still are kind of not completely caught up in terms of doing that basic archaeological, what I would call archaeological work. What do we have? Where is it? Who did it? Do we know? Where was it done? I'm much more interested in interpretation. And as a discipline, we haven't quite allowed ourselves to ask questions or answer questions that go beyond who was where, when, and explaining every stylistic choice or every iconographic choice when we have figures, which we do eventually get. And I, we should note that not all of these books stay purely geometricized in their decoration, but some do start to incorporate figures and in an interesting way. But people working on them haven't examined these choices in sophisticated manners yet and in an interpretive way. They've just sort of said, well, here it is. And if somebody has it, it's because they're between the North and the South. Ibn Cohen was halfway North, halfway South, and there were a lot of people traveling. So they brought these ideas and that was that. I think we can go a little bit farther, do a little bit more with asking fairly sophisticated questions about how images work, especially marginal images, to jog people's memories, how they work in a way that parallels orality, maybe. Lots of questions that we, and methodologies that we haven't really, haven't worked on. And part of it was because these works were not available. Now they're digitized. So you can sit at home and look at them and have, you have a lot more opportunity than we did 20 or 30 years ago when you saw one carpet page and that's the only thing anyone ever saw of that manuscript. So I'm hoping in the future, we'll allow ourselves to ask some of these questions, which people working in Christian art and Islamic art have been working on for a while. Thank you so much, Julie. It's been really enlightening to speak with you on these topics today. It's a pleasure. That was Julie Harris on the study of medieval Jewish art. You've been listening to an episode of Medieval Art Matters, hosted by Adam Cohen and me, Erica Lowick. Medieval Art Matters complements the book written by Jill Kasky, Adam Cohen, and Linda Safran, called Art and Architecture of the Middle Ages, Exploring a Connected World. It is published by Cornell University Press. For more information, go to the website that accompanies the book, artofthemiddleages.com, where you'll also find more podcasts in this series. Medieval Art Matters is made possible by the support of the Department of Art History at the University of Toronto, St. George Campus, and the Office of the Vice Principal and Dean, University of Toronto, Mississauga. Many thanks to the Toronto Consort for providing our music. This podcast was brought to you by Cited Media Productions. Thanks for listening. You have been listening to a Cited Media production. C-I-D-E-D.
I'm out more at sidedmedia.ca.